Hey everybody, I have an important and exciting announcement. We've actually been looking forward to this for a long time. On Sunday, May the 16th, we are going live with our service. And what that means is that you can join us at 10 a.m. Pacific time and you will actually be in our Anaheim campus service. And so this really affects all of you who have been watching on the live stream platform all weekend long. We're gonna consolidate all of those services into the 10 a.m. Pacific time live service. Now, we encourage everybody to watch it live on YouTube because that's a platform that we know we're gonna use for the long term. So, exciting, next Sunday, May the 16th, 10 a.m. Pacific time, let's go live. Well, hello and welcome to our Rocks online service. We're so happy you're here with us and happy Mother's Day weekend, by the way. We're glad that you chose to be with us here today. And we believe the Lord's gonna speak to you wherever you are. So wherever you are right now, just mutter under your own breath, would you? And just ask the Lord to speak to us. So Lord, we come before you right now, God, excited to receive what it is that you have to share with us, Lord, anticipating that you are going to speak a word that is relevant for us today. So speak today through this service, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let's prepare our hearts to worship together. Come on, let's sing together. This is the day that you and me, whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name. Now your joy awaits my praise I give thanks for all you have done And I will sing of your mercy and your love Your love is unfailing Lord, I am grateful Oh Lord, we give you thanks for all that you've done And what you will continue to do, Lord Come on, let's sing. When I was down, you brought me out and set my feet on higher ground. So here I stand, you are my God, your faithfulness, my solid rock. Oh, we give thanks, Lord. I give thanks for all you have done. I will sing of your mercy and your love Your love is unfailing Lord, I am grateful I give thanks for all you have done I won't forget all the battles you have won Your love is unfailing Lord, I am grateful together as we lift our hands and as we lift our hands the heavens open heavens open so let our lives declare the love our God has spoken come on let's lift up our hands and say and as we lift our hands the heavens open Heaven's open, so let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us. He has spoken over us. sing of your mercy and your love your love is unfailing lord i am grateful i give thanks for all you have done i won't forget all the battles you have won your love is unfailing lord i am grateful We praise your name, Lord. 
you are our rock, our solid foundation. And we trust in you. We put our hope and faith in you, God. And that's why today we can sing this. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. And he's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Sing that again. Praise his name. Oh, we sing it. Praise the
You know, we are a tithing and a missions giving ministry, and we believe in the tithe because it's biblical in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. I, I thank you each, by the way, for your giving and your partnership. It really does mean a lot. But I want to encourage you today from one of my favorite passages in the Bible when it comes to giving. This is a prayer actually that I have prayed over our family for years and years because I believe it's the heart of God in response to our cheerful giving. So I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's look at uh, verse 6. It says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, under pressure. For God loves a cheerful giver. Notice what God loves. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves someone who is giving with a cheerfulness in their hearts for the privilege of being able to give. And listen to verse 8. This is what I prayed for my family. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you having all sufficiency in all things at all times may abound in every good work. Isn't that extreme? I mean, if the Bible didn't say it, I wouldn't think that that was God's definition of his grace abounding toward us. But here's the heart of God to the cheerful giver. He says, I, my grace is able to abound to you so that you always have all sufficiency at all times and not just enough for you, but you have an abundance for every good work. That's what I want in my life. I hope that that is what you want in your life, that not only your needs are met, but that you have an abundance to give to every good work. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for expressing your heart that truly you are able to make all grace abound toward us so that we as your children who cheerfully give not only have our needs met, but Lord, that we can have an overflow to give to every good work. Thank you for those who continue to stand on your word. May every promise that you have given to them, even regarding them owning their own home, regarding uh, being a help to their children or to their parents, Lord, thank you that your promises and your word to us are yes and amen. May it be so and may it be fulfilled quickly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now let's take a look at these brief instructions about how you can give today. Giving is now easier with the Rock app. You can download it in your app store by searching Go to the Rock. Once you're in the app, click Give at the bottom of the page. Select your house church, congregation, or general giving and complete your giving details. Of course, you can always mail in your offering or hand deliver it to our church offices. You can also give on our website, go to the rock.com by clicking on Give. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing and helping us reach as many people as possible with God's love. for you. 
Father, we thank you for your word today. We pray that as we open up to the Gospel of John, that the Holy Spirit would open our eyes. In fact, may we see Jesus more clearly than ever before through this precious scripture in Jesus name. Amen. And hey, just before we open up our Bibles today, let me share a couple of things. Number one, the BFAM Training Center is open for enrollment for our next semester. And so those of you that feel like God has called you to be trained for ministry, this is a great opportunity. Go to BFAMTC.com. It's right there on your screens. And also, we have some training on how to start a house church. And so we've had interest forms. We've got a little video, but now we have training coming up May the 8th and May the 19th. And so to be able to sign up for the training, just go to the app and you can click on start a house church or go to the website and click on house churches and you'll scroll down there and you'll see the how to start a house church training. Just sign up for one of the three options and uh, it's free, but we want to help people and equip people to be able to get house churches started. All right, here we go. Ready? Grab your Bible right now. Hold it up. Let's declare there's no book like this book. It's right there on, on your screens. Let's say it together. Ready? Go. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. All right, here we go. Open up, please, to, you know where, the first chapter of the Gospel of John. And I've titled this message today, Glory, Grace, and Truth. And they all come from John 1, verse 14, just a powerful verse. But what I want to do is, I want to read verse 1, John 1, verse 1, and then we'll skip directly over to verses 14 through 18, which is the little paragraph that I want to cover today. But let's do it together. John chapter 1 and verse 1, and then we'll directly go to verse 14. Here's what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace." For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. Powerful portion of Scripture. I wanted to read verse 1 once again, even though we've covered everything through verse 13. I wanted to read verse 1, and the reason is because... Verse 1 is where verse 14 really picks up, okay? God says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, several weeks ago, when we covered verse 1, I mentioned this, that in the Greek language, that last phrase in verse 1, instead of saying, and the Word was God, it really reads, and God was the Word. Well, something clicked this week as I was studying uh, First John, or excuse me, the Gospel of John, once again, and I realized what I believe John was trying to say when he said, and God was the word. Uh, it was a different, it was like a reversal of the way that things were flowing. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God was the word. I feel like John was clarifying something for us. And I kind of alluded to this, but I think I, I'm seeing it more clearly. John is clearly linking the beginning of his gospel to the beginning of the whole Bible, where the whole Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now John is saying, well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and then, and God was the Word. In other words, he's saying, and the God who created the heavens and the earth, <laughs> he was the Word. Boy, I tell you, John is emphasizing who this is. This is not just somebody from God, but this is Creator God. Somebody said, well, is the Father not Creator God? No, of course the Father is Creator God. But God is one person. 
excuse me, God is one God, but three persons. And all three were involved in creation. But John is emphasizing that the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, before He became a human being, was just as much involved in creation to the point that when the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, John says, God was the Word. That is who the Creator is. And so we come directly now over to verse 14, and this is where we pick it up. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I'll spend the majority of my time on this, and you'll see why. I want to talk to you about glory, grace, and truth. But first, I have to hit this word, dwelt. John says, and the word became flesh or became a human being and dwelt among us. Now, John could have chosen several words to say, and the word lived among us. The word resided among us. But he, he chose this Greek word that's translated here, dwelt. And it's not the normal word that you would use to say he lived or resided among us. It's a word that specifically is talking about dwelling in a tent or more specifically, a tabernacle. And so John is using this word. It's the word that the Septuagint uses to translate. In fact, skenoo is the word here. It's the verb form of the noun uh, skinny, skinny. And skinny is used like 435 times in the Old Testament. Uh, of course, we're talking about the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And about two thirds of those times are about the tent or the tabernacle of Moses. So think about that. In John's mind, when he uses this word, skenoo, he is thinking about the tabernacle of Moses. This is how the Greek Old Testament use this word more often than any other thing. And here, John is specifically identifying this word, using this word, which is only used a handful of times in the New Testament. Okay? And he's using this word to say this, And the word, Creator God, who created the heavens and the earth, became a human being in flesh, and He tabernacled among us. Now, why would John say that? Well, there's a very good reason why he would say that. And it's because John is telling us that this same Jesus who came now in a tabernacle of human flesh is the same God that tabernacled among his people, the Jewish people, back in the Old Testament. And I want to show you that this is the case as we go on through this passage. But let's go on from here. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Watch this. And we have seen his glory. Now, the word that John is using for glory here, of course, is in Greek. But what's on John's mind is the Hebrew word for glory. Because the Hebrew is where the Old Testament scriptures talked about the glory of God, the kabod. And so John is thinking here, and the word became flesh, and he tabernacled among us. In fact, we saw his kabod. We saw the kabod of God. See, when you bring up the tabernacle, what does that bring to mind? That when Moses opened up the tabernacle for the very first time, the Bible says the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and a cloud hovered over the tabernacle, but the glory was inside of the tabernacle. And this is a, an important point. A lot of people associate the cloud with the glory. And of course, there is an association there, but we can't get mixed up as the cloud being the glory. Sometimes we'll call it the glory cloud, and there's nothing wrong necessarily with that. However, listen to what it says in, oh, let's see, in Exodus 40, verse 33. And Moses erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate in the court. And Moses finished the work. In other words, he finished the whole tabernacle. Verse 34, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory or the kabod of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the glory was on the inside of the tabernacle, but the manifestation of the glory, a cloud, was on the outside of the tabernacle. And this is exactly the picture that John is wanting us to understand when he says this, And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we have seen 
the glory. We have seen the glory, the kabod in Hebrew. We've seen that glory. Now, when exactly did John see that glory? Well, let's look quickly over to the Gospel of Matthew. Because John and James and Peter all saw the glory of God on Jesus. Matthew chapter 17 Mark and Luke also bring this up, but Matthew chapter 17, and notice it says in verse 1, And after six days Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, there's our guy right there, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light." Now, John, Peter, John, and James all saw this with their very own eyes. They're looking at the same Jesus that they've been walking around with and ministering with, but all of a sudden he looks so different. Why? Because his face is like on fire. His face is so bright, so, uh, so bright that it's brighter than the sun. And John now in John 1 is telling us, listen, we saw his glory. We saw his glory. So the creator God who created heaven and earth, he has become flesh and he has tabernacled among us this time in human flesh instead of the tabernacle of Moses. And just like the glory of God was inside of Moses, the glory of God is, was inside of Jesus. And in fact, John says, we actually saw that glory on one occasion. And of course, he's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. So he says, and we have seen his glory. Watch this. Glory, he uses the same word twice, as of the only Son from the Father. Now, some translations say the only begotten of the Father, like the New American Standard Bible and the New King James Version. They say the only begotten, which is also a good translation. But really, this word that's translated uh, of the only son, of the only son here in the ESV. It's really uh, one word and it depends on which gender of the word is used as to how the translation is. It's used for an only child. It could be an only son, could be an only daughter, could be an only child. For example, this same word is used with Jairus' daughter, but it's in the feminine form, the feminine gender. So we know it's an only daughter. The same word is used with the man who had the epileptic son. And except for in that uh, particular instance, it was in the neuter gender. In other words, there was no male or female. So we know that that meant it was his only child. But when it's in masculine or feminine, we just know that it's the only son or the only daughter. Well, here it's masculine. And so John says, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the one and only Son from the Father. And so he was begotten of the Father. He is the one and only Son of the Father. So both translations are really good. But you know, there's a big difference between being created or being made and being begotten. Something that's created is when somebody brings something that does not exist into existence. That's a creation. Something that's made is when you take parts or uh, material that is already in existence and you assemble it, you rearrange it, you put it together in such a way that it becomes useful for a particular purpose. However, when something's begotten, it's different because created things don't have the same essence, don't have the same nature as the creator. When God created the heavens and the earth, the heavens and the earth were not God. They were not divine. They were creations of God, but they were not God. When God makes something like he formed Adam's body out of the clay, out of the dirt, the dust, and he breathed life into it. Well, uh, Adam was not God or part of God. He was like God. He was uh, created in the image of God, but he was, did not have the same nature. Psalm chapter 8 tells us that man was made a little lower than God, than Elohim. See, and so uh, made is something different. However, when you beget something, you're begetting something of the same nature. Cats beget kittens. So they're of the same nature, the same quality 
as the original. Dogs beget puppies. Humans beget babies, see? And so these are not less in quality. They may be smaller, they may be less mature, and they have to grow. But nonetheless, they're of the same nature and the same quality in the same way. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And so that's why He is of the same quality. He is of the same nature as God. So notice again, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we have seen His glory. The glory like in the tabernacle of Moses that was inside, that filled the tabernacle. And John it could easily say, and we've seen the cloud. We've seen the manifestation of the glory in terms of signs, wonders, healings, miracles, and such. The authority over the wind and the sea, etc., etc. He said, we've seen all of that as well. But there's another type of glory that... John would, would assert as well, and that's this. When he would listen to Jesus teach, and he would hear the purity of his words, the wisdom of the words that he spoke, when he would see the character of Jesus. And, and this is what he's bringing the end of verse 14 to, is there was another part of his glory besides just that glowing power from within. And it was his very character. It was his very nature. It was the way he treated people. It was the way he spoke to people. And it, it summed up in these words, notice at the end. It says, glory as of the only, the one and only Son from the Father, watch this, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Now, if we were just going to make a list of all the characteristics of Jesus, I mean, it could be a hundred or more that we could list. Things like peace, things like wisdom, knowledge, understanding, sensitivity, intuitiveness, kindness, gentleness, etc., etc. We could just go on and on with the characteristics of Jesus. But John says, let me tell you the two things that impacted us the most. And we realize he is just full of these two things, grace and truth. Well, the word grace is the Greek word charis. And charis is used all over the New Testament. Of course, Paul talks so much about grace. We're not under the law, but we're under grace. Well, John says, let me tell you something about Jesus. He didn't just have grace. He didn't just demonstrate grace. He was filled to capacity. This word full means full to the greatest extent with. And he said, Jesus was full of grace. Well, we could look at many passages in the New Testament that would show how Jesus was full of grace, but I don't know any better one than to consider his ministry to the man from Gadara. Jesus, think about this, his assignment that day was to go across the lake to the east side of the Sea of Galilee and to minister to one man. Jesus was completely exhausted from his heavy ministry schedule. We know that because once they got out on the lake, there was a demonically inspired windstorm. I mean, this windstorm was so great that this boat that they were on was literally filling up with water. These fishermen who were on the boat, they were so accustomed to be on, being on this lake, they knew when they were in dire danger, and they were. And so here Jesus is, he's exhausted, he's sleeping through this storm, and the disciples come and wake him up yelling at him. They are accusing him of being selfish. They are accusing him of being loveless. He doesn't even care that they're about to die. And what does Jesus do? He gets up in the boat. He rebukes the wind and he says to the sea, be still. And the whole wind calmed and the disciples were amazed. And then Jesus proceeded to address their immaturity. He, he addressed their faithlessness that they believed somehow that they were going to die, even though he said, let us cross to the other side. And they made it over to the other side. Well, once they got there, guess what happens? There's a man. There's a, a homeless man. He is a naked man. This man is so broken that he runs around the graveyard all day long, screaming and yelling and taking sharp no, uh, stones and gashing himself with these stones. 
He is the person that all the parents tell their children, you stay far away from him. If you ever see him, make sure to go the other way. He is scary. They have no idea what he's going to do. And the problem is that this man is completely demonized, not just with a few demons, but with many, many demons. In fact, the demons will later call themselves legion. And so Jesus comes up to this shore on the boat. And the moment he hits the shore, this man comes running down from the tombs up in the hills. He's screaming and he runs right up to Jesus and falls before him. And he still has the chains and the shackles where people tried to bind him. No doubt a group of men all went together to hold him down and to bind him up to try to lock him up because he was just being a complete nuisance in the region. And those demonic spirits inside were so powerful. I mean, they broke those chains as if they were toothpicks. And now here's this man coming and he falls before Jesus. Jesus doesn't flinch. Jesus doesn't get back. You know what many of us would have done when we saw somebody screaming and coming down from the tombs naked, running directly at us? We have told everybody, get back in the boat, get back in the boat. And we'd have been out of there. But not Jesus. No, this man this broken man, this nuisance, the lowest person in the society was the very man Jesus came here for. And this man comes running up to Jesus and falls down before Jesus. And then this monstrous like voice comes out of him. It's the demon speaking. Have mercy on us. What have we to do with you? Don't send us into the abyss. Let us go into the pigs. And here they are talking in Jesus without in any way belittling this man, speaks to these demonic spirits saying, what is your name? And they answer, we are legion because we are many. And let us go into the pigs. And somehow, it doesn't explain it in the text, but somehow these demon spirits knew that Jesus was not about to let them stay in this man. They understood that there was a distinction. There was a value differential between human life and animal life. I know that there are a lot of animal lovers. I love animals as well. However, you need to know that Jesus is one of the ones in the Bible that help us to understand that even though God created animals and loves animals, there is a huge differential between the value of human beings who were created in the image and likeness of God and animals. Do you remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter six, he said, look at the birds. He said, your heavenly father feeds the billions and billions of birds of the world every day of how much more value are you than all the birds. One human being is far more valuable than all the birds of the world combined. You have to understand who you are, who you were created to be, the level of creation, the level of personhood that you have been given that you have become because of the Lord. And here this man comes and this voice and these demonic spirits are saying, let us go into the pigs. They, they somehow knew he's not going to let us stay here. He's not going to let us continue to damage and ravage this man. And they were right. And Jesus instantly said, go. And these demons went out. And I mean, they entered these pigs and these pigs violently ran down a, a steep slope. I've been to this location many times and right into the Sea of Galilee and they all drowned. Well, let me tell you, John was there. John watched this whole thing happen. He, he saw it. He listened. He saw. He heard. He experienced it. And, you know, you, you can't forget a situation where somebody commands some 2000 demons or so out of a man and into 2000 pigs and watch all this happen. You, you can't forget that. But John is saying, you know, when I look back on this and situations like it, what really captures my heart is not so much the power, not so much the authority, but the grace the grace of this man. Think about it. I mean, when all this happened, this, this man, when these demons left, was so delivered. He was so set free that instantly he regained consciousness. Instantly, where he had lost all self-awareness, all dignity whatsoever. 
he instantly regained consciousness and somehow realized the humiliating state that he'd been living in. He looked and he finds himself naked. He finds himself cut. And what does he do? Somehow or another, he acquires some clothes. And this man instantly gets completely dressed and comes and sits down near Jesus and is able to converse in his right mind for the first time in how many years? And and John is remembering this. And now all the city is now coming out because they heard about this. And people in the surrounding towns and villages are coming out now. And guess what? When they see what happened, when they hear the story, when they look at the man and they see that this man that they'd all been afraid of and have avoided and nobody knew what to do with him. Now he's clothed. He's sitting. He's in his right mind. He's able to converse as a normal part of society. And what is Jesus reward? For doing such a wonderful act for this man, they begged him to leave. Please, can you go? This is, this is kind of freaky. Can you just leave? And John is impressed with what Jesus did. Because Jesus, he didn't, he didn't attack them for their disdain for him, nor for their complete pathetic apathy for this man who was just changed a member of their own community. No. What did Jesus do? He turned and very quietly, he got back into the boat to leave. And then for a second time, here comes this man running at Jesus, this time in his right mind. And he's coming and he's begging him, please let me go with you. Can I come with you? He wanted to become a disciple of Jesus. He wanted to follow him. But Jesus knew this was not to be. This was not his calling. And so Jesus says something to him that I think is very touching. He said these very words. He said, go to your home, to your friends. Two things that this man had not had in years. And he said, and tell them what great mercy God has had on you. Oh, he told him to go. And the story goes on to say that he didn't just go to his home and his friends. This man went to all the Decapolis. Decapolis was 10 cities. This man went to the 10 cities in that region and he shared with everybody what great, overwhelming grace and mercy God had had on him to come and to reach him. And John now writing the Gospel of John some 40 years after these events, and he's remembering all these things that happened and maybe even remembering this very story and thinking, oh, he was so tired. He was so exhausted. And yet he knew somehow that there was this man on the other side of the lake and we had to go across. We had to fight this storm and endure uh, the, the risk of our very lives to get over to this man. And John's thinking, no doubt, this man wasn't even Jewish. Jesus said his assignment was not for the Gentiles, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And here this man was a Gentile. In fact, everybody over there, they were Gentiles. God had made no covenant to them. God had made no promises that Jesus needed to keep. It was sheer compassion. It was just grace for him to go and to minister to this man and to help him and deliver him. And John is telling us this is the way he was all the time. He was full of grace. He wanted to help people, people who were sinful, people who were undeserving people who were hurting, people without anybody to help them. If somebody was in deep debt, Jesus would want to deliver them. If somebody had a terminal illness, he would want to heal them. If a couple's marriage was falling apart, Jesus would want to restore their marriage. If a child had gone astray, Jesus would want to see that child come back home to a loving family. John said he was like that all the time, and he was so sacrificial. He would, he would sacrifice convenience. He would sacrifice preference. He would stop his uh, agenda to be able to help somebody in need. John said one of the things about him is he was full of grace. But there was another word. Jonathan, uh, John said he was not only full of grace, but he was full of truth. And this is a very interesting word as well. The word truth is the word aletheia, aletheia. 
And aletheia doesn't mean just truth like we would know it. It literally means not forgotten, not forgotten. John is saying he was full of grace, but he was also full of not forgotten. He was full of a not forgotten truth. What does that mean? Well, if some event happened and you were there, you saw it. And then weeks later, years later, you remember that event accurately and you can rehearse what happened while you're speaking the truth because you have not forgotten what actually happened. Well, this not forgotten would apply to things that happened. It would also apply to Jesus not forgetting the commandments of God, the word of God, the laws of God, not forgetting the character of God, not forgetting, listen, the promises of God. John is saying, no, he was so full of truth. He was so full of integrity. He was so full of honesty. If he made a commitment, he would keep that commitment. If he said something, he would remember that he said it. If he did something, he would remember that he did it. Now, we know that Jesus never sinned, but did he ever make a mistake? Did he ever trip and break something? Did he ever drop something and it break? Did he ever do something that uh, was harmful to somebody inadvertently? Well, no doubt he did because he was a human being. So no doubt something slipped out of his hands and, you know, it was broken. Well, John's saying, oh, that's the thing about Jesus. He, he would take responsibility. He was so transparent, so honest. He was full of grace, but he was also full of truth. I can't think of a better example in the ministry of Jesus of being full of grace and truth than the adulterous woman. Early one morning in the temple, Jesus is having a teaching session, the Bible says, and many were there to listen to Jesus teach. And what happens? The scribes and the Pharisees drag some lady right in the middle of where he's teaching, intentionally dis disrupting his whole teaching session. And they said, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. So it's like they somehow must have dragged her out of bed. And they said she was caught in the very act. It makes you wonder, well, where's the man? You know, it takes, it takes two to tango. Where's the guy? Why is it that they're just bringing this lady? Well, we don't know the answer to that. But nonetheless, they bring her in here and they say, this lady was caught in the very act. And according to the law of Moses, the Bible says that she should be stoned. What do you say? Now, let me tell you, the, these men were not caring about this lady. It wasn't the lady's sin that was the issue. No, very clearly in John chapter 8, it says they were testing Jesus to try to catch him. What were they trying to catch him on? They were trying to make him choose between grace and truth. <laughs> they were both necessary in this situation. And yet they said he'll, he, he'll have to choose. He'll have to decide. Is he going to go with the scriptures, the law of Moses? Or is he going to do what we've seen him do many times and be gracious toward this lady? And so Jesus bent down and he started writing and they're pressing him. What should we do? Moses said to Stoner, what should we do? And Jesus is writing on the ground. And when they continued to press her, Jesus stood up and said, let the one who has no sin throw the first stone. Well, there was only one person in that group that had no sin, and that was Jesus. And he bent down and he started writing again. And what happened? They began to be convicted. And from the oldest who had sinned the most to the youngest, they left one by one until there was nobody left except for Jesus and that adulterous woman. And Jesus looked at her and he said, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And then Jesus said these words, and I want you to listen very clearly. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go. And as you go, sin no more. Now watch this. Neither do I condemn you. Go. Folks, that's grace. Here this woman was caught in the very act of adultery, and Jesus is giving her another sh shot. He is forgiving her and saying, I don't condemn you either. Go. But then he follows that up and said, and as you go, sin no more. See, he doesn't in any way condone anything less than what the scriptures call for. 
No, he said, you need to not sin. You need to not live in adultery. So he called her up to another level. But I want you to notice before he called her up to another level, he gave her the grace she needed to regain her dignity, to be forgiven, and then to begin to walk in obedience. Oh, what a day for this lady. She thought, my life's over. I'm going to die today. And yet Jesus in grace gave her back her life. And yet at the same time, stayed true to the scriptures and said, sin no more. John is saying, man, as I look back, I've never seen anybody be so full of grace. And I've never seen anybody be so full of truth. And certainly not at the same time. But that's the way Jesus was. He was just like that. Well, let me finish this up because this is so powerful here. Notice verse 15. There's a parenthetical statement, at least in the English Standard Version. John says he was full of grace and truth. And John the Baptist bore witness about him and cried. This is he of whom I said he comes. Uh, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Well, I think this is interesting that he brings John the Baptist up again. That's why I think the translators here put it in parentheses because it doesn't seem to flow with the points. But John, I believe the, the the Apostle John is remembered. Oh, I think this is what John the Baptist was alluding to when he made this statement. So he put it in here and the Holy Spirit evidently was putting it in here as well. But John the Baptist bore witness about him. In other words, John the Baptist knew that Jesus, the coming one, was going to be full of grace and truth. And John was saying, oh, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. Because he's going to be so high, so much higher. He ranks so much higher than me. And then he says this. And because he was before me. Well, the, the writer, John, here has already established Jesus' preexistence. He's creator God, certainly. But it seems to me that John the Baptist is not just saying that Jesus is forever existed. But that he's saying, look. I'm coming to Israel and I'm preparing the way before him. But he, there's something you need to know that the one who's coming has already been here. Oh, yes. In fact, he's been on this very land, the promised land, Israel. And and how has he been here? He was the one living in the tabernacle. How do we know that? I'm going to show you here in just a moment. Watch this. Verse 16. For from his fullness, for from his fullness, what fullness? Well, John said he was full of grace and truth. And from his fullness of grace and truth, we have all received grace upon grace. And you just hear this grace upon grace upon grace. Well, what does that mean, grace upon grace? Well, Paul said in Romans, he said, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. But now John is saying grace upon grace, grace upon grace. Well, we not only need grace to be forgiven from our sins, but we also need grace to strengthen us to be obedient to God so that we stop sinning. See, this is grace and truth. There is grace to be forgiven where we've missed it. But there's also grace to be able to be obedient to the truth. And so John says we've received grace upon grace. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What does that mean? The law is you need to do this and you need to do that and the other. And if you don't, there are consequences. He said, yeah, that came through Moses. And Romans tells us that the reason God gave the law was to show us that we have to have a savior, that there's no way we can measure up to the holiness of God just by trying to be good enough. And so John said, listen, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God. This is the same word for the only son from the father up in verse 14. So we could translate it like this. No one has ever seen God, the one and only son. And then it says God, the one and only son, God, who is at the father's side. He has made him known. John said, Jesus came and he showed us all that grace, all that truth that he brought, all that compassion and mercy for people. He was showing us this is what the father's like. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. The father is full of grace. The father is full of truth. And the father 
is full of glory. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be learning this from the Gospel of John. I want to close with 2 Corinthians 3.18. Let's look there. 2 Corinthians 3.18. And this is where Paul is talking about Moses and how Moses would come face to face with God. And in the one passage where Moses was getting the replacement for the Ten Commandments, the Bible says that he went up and he was face to face with God. And when he came down, his face was literally glowing. And this went on for some time. God, uh, Moses would go up and he would meet with God face to face. His face would become very bright because the glory that was coming from God would be absorbed in the pores of his skin. And then Moses would come down. People would see the shining of his face. But then Moses would put a veil on. Not so that people couldn't see the glory on his face, but that people couldn't see that it was passing away. And so he would put a veil on so that they couldn't see it diminishing, just like we hide our weaknesses. He was hiding his weakness that this glory was not really coming from him. It had come from God and was, had been absorbed into his skin. And so now Moses would unveil his face when he was with God. And, uh, and absorb that glory and his, his own person would be transformed. And then he would come down and after the people would see the glory, he would put the veil over again. But notice the last verse here in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. And Paul says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Notice again, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. Now when this says beholding, that word beholding in the Greek has the sense of beholding in a mirror, like you're looking in a mirror normally at yourself. But in this case, uh, Paul is saying this, when we come to the Word of God and we're looking into the Word, well, you can see yourself. You can see your own flaws. You can see your own weaknesses, no doubt. Just like looking in a mirror. I have a hair out of place. I have something in my tooth or whatever. You can see all of this. He said, but if you keep looking at the word, you're going to see another image. And the image is the Lord. So notice again, and we all with unveiled face, don't hide anything. Don't Come without confessing your sins. Just come and be open and honest before the Lord. We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. He's saying you'll begin to see an image. And who's the image? You'll begin to see the image of Jesus, the glory of God. And that's exactly what's happening as we're walking through the Gospel of John. We're seeing Jesus. We're seeing His image. And Paul is telling us here, if you'll keep looking and looking into the Word of God, stay with us in this series, and even more so, spend time with your face in the Word. He said what's going to happen is the very glory of the Son of God is going to be transforming you into His image. You're going to be coming, becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ, more full of grace, more full of truth, and more full of of God's glory. Praise God. I don't know about you, but I want that. Let's pray. Can we, would you bring yourself before the Lord and let's say, Lord, you're so full of grace. You're so full of truth. And yet we find ourselves lacking in these things. We're not always full of grace and we're not even always full of truth. We cover ourselves. We blame shift. Uh, we're not completely forthright and honest, but Lord, we want to be like you. And we thank you for being like you are. And we pray in the name of Jesus that you would transform us into your image as we continue to focus on your image, your person through the word of God. We ask you to change us, minister to us. In Jesus name we pray, amen and amen. Praise God. Oh, I hope you're enjoying this Gospel of John like I am. And I pray that you just stick with us. Just stay with us. Let's walk through this whole beautiful book and let God just unpack every single verse to us so that we can understand what the Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle John. Praise God. Well, don't forget now we've got 
all of these how to start a house church uh, sessions that we're offering May the 8th, May the 19th. You can go on the app or you can go on the website to be able to access these. And don't forget, enrollment is now open again for the BFAM Training Center. Just go to BFAMTC.com. God bless you and we'll see you next week. Well, praise the Lord. As you can see, he's clearly speaking to us as we're walking through the book of John together that Jesus operated in grace and truth, which is how we need to operate. And so hopefully you're becoming more like Jesus as we walk through and talk about how Jesus conducted himself. Hey, by the way, don't forget, if you want to be a part of the house church movement that's happening right now, and yes, it's a movement that's starting right now, you simply go to your Rock app and click on Start a House Church or go to our Rock website and click on House Churches and then watch the Why House Church video. And I think you'll be really blown away with what the Lord is doing with house churches. And I think you'll be compelled to start one and to jump on board as well. So don't miss out on that. And other than that, guys, we love you. Happy Mother's Day weekend again. We're so happy you joined us and we'll see you next week.